Good morning, y'all. My name is Eric. I'm a student in the Hope Youth Ministries here at Hope, and I serve in Hope Kids. Um, please stand for today's reading. Our passage today is Galatians 5, 1 through 15. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that you, if, if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still tr preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. You may be seated. Can you turn around and shake someone's hand or say hello to them this morning for a moment? Do you mind doing that, please? Get comfortable. Isn't it interesting after Eric left the podium here, the, the podium just actually got taller, didn't it? It's amazing. Yes. It's a, we have one of those special podiums that does that. Thank you, Eric. Great job. Uh, outstanding job. When you put a, a high school student up here, and it just I think it takes a, a, a lot of courage for them to share with you the Word of God, and, and so excited that they're doing that as well. A few weeks ago or last week, it might have been Paige, and now Eric, so it's a great Great opportunity for them to be involved as well. Hey, listen, today, grab your Bibles, your device is going to welcome all of you this morning on campus, those of you who are joining us online as well, to, again, Galatians chapter 5. You say, Mark, we just read the same verses that we read last week. I know, we actually did, and it's not a mistake either, because we, as we said last week, that chapter 5 is Paul's conclusion, or the beginning of his conclusion of the book of Galatians. And so what I really believe as I read through chapter five is that he saved some of the really good stuff for us at the end. You know, it's kind of like if you're writing a letter to someone or sending an email, that many times if it's a long one, then the last few lines are the most memorable, the things that they recall, I think, quickly. And so Paul kind of, I believe, has written the letter like that for you and I today for us to recall some things at the very end that is very powerful. Because chapter 5 is where we find sayings like, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And we've heard that if you've been in church a lot for very long. If you've not, then we'll talk about that this morning. It's where we find that of stay, stay, uh, staying in step with the Spirit. It's also where we find uh, the reference to the fruit of the Spirit as well. And so it's an exciting chapter to go through. I want to cover just for a moment for review, some from last week, and then we will start with verse 6 and work our way through through verse 15 together. So let me jump right in because we have a lot to cover this morning and I want to get as much as possible with you. And so I'll go back to what Eric just read. Verse 1, it says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And where we started last week was this understanding that you and I have been freed from something and we have been freed to something that we have been freed from something and we have been freed to something. So we established in our teaching last week that we were freed from things like meaningless religion, from a religion that is just absolutely devoid of joy, that hems you in completely and there's no freedom in that, that what Paul says we are free from that. And then we also discovered that we're free from something we call this behavioral modification in your life that's founded on fear. And we used an illustration last week of a carrot and a stick. And that is that 
we work in our life to do good deeds because we don't want to miss heaven and we don't want to gain hell. And so carrot is, the, is heaven and, and the stick was hell. And so we are freed from this motivational modification of our life, doing better, being a better person that's based on fear. And the third thing we discovered is that we're free from being our own God, that we don't have to have all the answers to all the complex questions of life. Thank God for that, right? That we don't have to have all of those answers, so we're freed from that. Paul starts out way back in chapter one, and he says to you and I that we have been freed from a different gospel, not another gospel, because there's only one gospel, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ, but we've been freed from a different or a different gospel. And that means that there is something else out there that masks itself as a gospel. And what Paul does, he lays this out for us from the beginning. And he says that it is this teaching of that of Christ plus performance. It's a teaching of Christ plus performance within our lives. So in other words, the cross is not enough. We have to help God out in our spiritual development. So he says we're freed from that. So what are we freed to? And we read verse six last week, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision or uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. And what he's saying is this to you and I, and I wanna, I wanna uh, just hammer this one more time before we move on to the rest of chapter 15 or chapter five next week. But he says that, what we are freed from is we're freed from, well, neither religion nor the lack of religion, whether we're freed from religion or the lack of religion in our life. He says, Mark, well, I don't understand what that means. You know, what does that mean? He uses two words here, circumcision and uncircumcision. I know we've said that a lot through this teaching, right? And I can't help it. It's Paul's words. Blame him. When you get to heaven, find Paul and ask him why he talks about that so much, right? But he uses these words very powerfully here for a point. And when he talks about circumcision, we have to see in context, he's writing to the Judaizers, those that would tell the Greeks that in order to be a Christian, you gotta look Jewish, so you gotta be circumcised. So it is, it is that of Christ plus surgery. And so he says you gotta be circumcised to be a Christian. And so what he's saying is this, it's talking about that of a spiritual success. It's, it, the way I see it is it's relating to the days of my life when I get it all right. And then he talks about uncircumcision. So that has to be the opposite of spiritual failure of the days that I get it wrong. And why does he do this? Because you and I in our life, we find ourselves flowing in and out of the days that we get it right with God and the days that we get it wrong. Can I get an Amen. So let me see if I'm in the right crowd, all right? How many of you, just, just taking the second, how many of you had a day this week where you just didn't get it right spiritually? Let me see your hand. Terrific, good. Because I was gonna fold up the notes and go home, right? And this was it, yes. And we would try the next service and maybe I was more fortunate with them because we have those. And, we, and so, Paul, I love it because the Holy Spirit is so relevant in these words to you and I because he says, hey, here's the thing. For those days when you get it right and for those days when you get it wrong, neither position counts. I love this. What it says to you and I is this, that God is not keeping score. Neither of those positions count the day I get it right or the day I get it wrong. When it comes to God loving me and God accepting me and God being for me and not against me, that it simply doesn't give me a leg up with God, nor does it give me a leg up with anyone else around me in this room the days I get it right or the days I get it wrong. He said, but wait a minute, Mark, that kind of doctrine is very dangerous, because that kind of doctrine could lead to what, well, theologically we call it license or permissiveness. And when I think about that, I thought, yeah, it probably would have been seen and felt that very same way when the first time that letter was read in that region of Galatia and the Judaizers who were saying to the, to the Greeks, hey, you got to do this to be saved. It's not enough just to believe in Christ. So they probably thought, wait a minute, this doctrine that Paul is talking about could lead to license. What does that mean? 
It could lead to just, well, we can live however we want. And when the Greeks heard this, they're probably thinking, wow, what a great load that is taken off of me because I realize it's just simple faith in Christ. It is all I need. And so there had to be some real mixed feelings in that room when this letter was first read. Just like there's mixed feelings in this room this morning as I read this and share this with you. And so what he's saying is those positions, whether those positions are spiritual success or spiritual failure, Paul says, hey, they have no value. They have no value with God. The only thing that has value with God is that is that faith as it's expressed through love is what he says. Because the gospel... The gospel is the only thing that energizes my love and my relationship with God and not the days that I get it right and surely not the days that I get it wrong. So we're free to serve God in love no longer through fear. So those of you this morning that have struggled with your assurance of your salvation, you have struggled with this assurance based upon the fact that you're not sure how God sees you or accepts you because of your behavior, Paul says, wait a minute. The reality is, the truth is, God is not keeping score here. Understand that. So there are days you're going to get it right, and there are days you're going to get it wrong, but those days have absolutely no effect on God's love for you in, his lo- in your life. And I think it's a powerful thought. That I am secure, not in my faithfulness, but I am secured in his faithfulness. So look at verse 2. And and we're reviewing last week. We're going to get to what we need to get to this morning, but hang on for a minute. He says, look. Paul says, wait a minute. I want you to look at this for a moment. He says, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. Those are really strong words. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace, not out of grace, but away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. And if you need more context, go online and listen to the teaching from last week. It gives you more of that. But here's the thought, because I think this is a moment for introspection in our own life. So is this for you today an outside-in or an inside-out experience with God? It's a huge question. Is this for you an outside-in or an inside-out experience with God today? Because in my, in my relationship, in this, uh, in this journey of sanctification, that what I realize that I have to look and say, is this an outside-in or an inside-out experience? How, how, How am I seeing God this morning and how God works in my life? And Paul says this, hey, if you don't want to live under grace, and I think that's such an interesting thought, if you don't want to live under grace and you'd rather live under the law, the rules, that that the cross plus performance, that in that moment, He's bold enough to say to you and I that you really don't need a savior. Is exactly what he's saying. That you and I really do not need a savior. Why? Because if you can save yourself by being good enough, then why do you need a savior? And thus he says, Christ will be of no advantage to you. Is exactly what he means. And it's a warning to us. It's a warning to us this morning, sitting here in Hope Fellowship, that Paul has issued from the very beginning of our study in chapter one regarding the acceptance of the doctrine of the cross plus performance. It's a warning. And then he adds something that's sobering to all of this. And he says, if you live by this outward in experience, if you live by this experience with God, that it is your works that changes your heart and transforms you on the inside if you are living that way in your life, then you have obligated yourself to all of the law. You have obligated yourself to every word of the law and not just to keep it, but to keep it perfectly. And I think before we move on, you have to understand the weight of Paul's words this morning to us. (laughs) And I look this over and I, I sit in this for a long time and, 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 I, and when I realized this, I realized that, 
that what he's saying is that, that I can't pick and choose which ones that I live by. So today I say, well, I don't need to lie and I don't need to covet, but tomorrow I may need to do a little lying and a little coveting because I just don't know what might happen at work. So I, I, and, and, and so to, today I don't, I don't need to murder, you know, in my life. And that's, that's part of the commands. You say, Mark, I don't think you have to really worry about that in, in my life. But what I realize is when I go back to Proverbs 18 and it says to me that, the power of life and death is in the tongue. And when I look at that text in context, which we have taken out of context for years in church, what it means, it means about relationships. It means how I speak to you and how I talk to you and my tone when I use you in harsh words. And so if I'm gonna live with this outside in relationship with God, that God needs my help in making me saved and making me right before him and for him to love me, then what I realize is this, that Well, I can never, ever speak another harsh word to anybody in my entire life. Some of you are already in trouble, aren't you? Because you're thinking some harsh things about somebody else right now, probably me, right, for what I'm saying to you. Absolutely right. I can never do that again in my entire life. And here is what Paul is saying. I want you to grasp this. We didn't, we didn't take a lot of time in this last week, but I wanted you to really understand the passion behind what he's saying. He's saying that not only can you never say another harsh word against anybody the rest of your life, but if you do say a harsh word, then all the other kind words that you will speak throughout the rest of your life has in no way the power to make up for that one harsh word that you said to someone before if you're living under an outside-in relationship with God. Boy, that makes it real. That really brings it out, doesn't it, for you and I, how passionate Paul is about this message to you and I. You know? It's heavy, isn't it? It is. You know, I thought about when my boys were small and, you know, they're, they're two or three, three years old perhaps, and they would say things to Reba and I like, they would say, I hold you. I don't know if you've ever had a kid say, I hold you. Well, what they're wanting to do is they're wanting you to hold them, right? But it's just where they are in their development and speech. And, and so I remember with my boys, what I would do is I would sit them on the couch and, and I would say, okay, hold me. And I would sit in their lap when they're about three years old, right? And, and I don't know if you've ever done that and you laugh about it. Well, what you do is that you keep all your weight on your legs and you don't put all of your weight on your three-year-old. Why? Because it's not funny to crush your three-year-old. Isn't that right? Say, Mark, you don't know my three-year-old, right? (laughs) Well, that's another thought, okay? And perhaps you need to pray through that one. But yet, the reality is you don't do that because it takes all the, the joy and the fun out of laughing. They're laughing, you're laughing, they're holding you, and they think it's really funny. Because if you place all of your weight upon them, you crush them. For those of you in the room that are living this outside-in relationship with God. And so you are earning his love and his acceptance in your life, that you are counting the days you get it right, and you are counting the days you get it wrong, even when he is not. Can I tell you that that weight will crush you? Because you are not disciplined enough to live that way and you are not moral enough to live that way, and you are not upright enough to be justified by you keeping all the rules, and that weight will crush you. And so Paul says that when we live like that, that you and I find ourselves moving away from grace is what he says. Here's what grace does. Grace acknowledges our sin. You say, Mark, my sin would never fit in that box. Oh, hang on, I have you covered. Just a minute, okay? All right? 
because I don't want to leave anybody out in the room. So maybe this is more like you, right? Yeah. Is, is that you? I don't know. Perhaps it is. So Mark, that does it. And some of you saying, Mark, you don't understand my past. Oh, I have all of you covered as well. Hang on just a minute, okay? Because I want to make sure that we all connect with this. And so that's for everybody else, right? Yes. And so what, what I realize is that what Paul is saying to you and I is that grace has this amazing ability to do two things in our life. One, grace acknowledges our sin. The work of grace is not to ignore the sin of my life. The work of grace is to acknowledge the sin of my life. So grace acknowledges the sin of my life, but not only does it stop there, none of you really connect with that one, right? You don't, I know that, right? Yeah. We'll use that one. That's better. I'll just choose the one in the middle. So not only does grace acknowledge my life, and I think sometimes we're afraid of grace because we think that grace just, you know, it it just covers everything, and, and so it pretends that sin is not there. That's not it at all. In fact, what grace does for you and I, grace brings us to repentance within our life. Understand that. Realize that that real grace brings us to a place of transformation in our life. So grace acknowledges the sin of our life, and not only that, but grace covers the sin of our life completely. So that when the Father sees you and I in his holiness and perfection, that before grace he could not look upon us, But now, through his son Jesus and the work of the gospel in our lives, that he sees us through that work of his son, so he is able to look upon you and I as his children. Grace covers and grace acknowledges. Let me tell you what the law does for a moment. Here's what just living by rules does and living by the outside-in doctrine Here's what it does. It acknowledges your sin is what it does. Sure it does. It makes you feel guilty for what you've done in life. It makes you even feel remorseful at times for what you've done. It points out all your failures and it points out all the times that you have broken God's law. It points all of those out. So grace and the law are very much like that in in that one way. Here's where they're different. The law, the rules, living that outside in lifestyle has no ability to cover your sin. That's the difference. It has no ability to cover your sin. So what does that mean? That means that if you're living the outside in life, then you walk around the rest of your life in guilt. You walk around the rest of your life feeling just that heavy, heavy load of that. And why, how do you correct that? Because we're going to do that. You're going to correct that by simply trying to do better deeds. And so what you're going to do is you're thinking that the better deeds and the more better deeds that you do, it outweighs the bad deed that you did. And at some point, it all balances out on a big scale. You see, this is what Christ has freed us from. This is what Paul wants you and I to know, that this is what he has freed you and I from today. He has set us free not to live life like we wanted outside of God's values and outside of God's commands. That's not at all. We're going to talk about that in a moment, so i got to hurry. But yet, what he's saying is that this is what he has freed you and I from. He's freed us to love him. He's freed us to love him not out of fear. He's freed us to not just serve him so that when we die that we go to heaven. That's the carrot that hangs in front of us and we miss hell, which is the stick that we used last week. That's not it at all. No, he's freed us to love him and understand that, that our faith is worked out through the gospel today and not just you and I trying to work it out on our own because it's way too heavy and it's going to crush us at some point.
That's the outside in approach to God. And so what I realized is this journey that we're on this morning, this journey that you and I, and we use that term a lot, will forever be an inside-out experience. And what I want to say to you this morning is, and to realize this, that just because you like the idea of Christ and, and, and just doesn't mean that you love him and doesn't mean that you know him and doesn't mean that you follow him, doesn't mean that, but this simply has to be a transformational work within your life that starts with inside of you and that transformation inside of your heart and your life causes your behavior to change outside of you. Regardless of the good days and the bad days because God doesn't keep count. You say, but Mark, you don't know how messy my life is. Can I tell you God does? Amen. Isn't that true? That God does? And can I tell you about church? Welcome to the mess. Really. Welcome to the mess. You are surrounded by messy people. Do you not? You're surrounded by sinners and seekers and skeptics and scoundrels and scallywags. And I couldn't think of any more S words. I really couldn't, right? I was just racking my brain last night thinking, give me more S words. Maybe you can text me one or, or email me one today. But yet, look, you're part of this. And what I realize is that the beauty of this is we all come into this place messed up. And we all come into the place struggling in, 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 this, in this walk with God. And I can't fix that. And when I come to the moment and the realization that I can't fix that, When I come to that place in my life, I surrender that to God and I feel the weight of that lifted off of me But because it was always God's weight to carry anyway and never mine. Because I could never fix me. Wow. So verse six says this. And we just read this, but I want to read it to get to verse seven is where we get to something that we didn't talk about last week. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. You were running well, who hindered you from obeying the truth. This persuasion is not from him who calls you. Now, I'm going to move this for a moment because some of you over there can't see. And some of you are still trying to figure out which box would hold your sin, right? So I'm going to move that over there out of the way for a sec. So here's what I'm going to say to you about this text I just read. It's just not enough to start well. And we didn't talk about this last week. We touched it for a moment, but I want to talk to you about it for a second. It's just not enough to start well, is what Paul says because I think in this journey with God, we start out, we start out well, don't we? We start out with this moment of, of, of salvation, this moment of redemption in our life. The Spirit does this amazing work within us, and, and it is so powerful what God does. And so when we have talked and taught through these verses and these chapters, we remember in chapter 4 is where that Paul simply pulls out the story of Abraham and Isaac and Ishmael and Sarah and Hagar. And so we find ourselves starting out like an Isaac, don't we? That we're a child of promise and this is a work of the Spirit within our lives. And man, this is great and we're free. But as life tends to work on us and we go through all these stages of life in our walk with God, we find ourselves someday waking, one day waking up and we find ourselves no longer an Isaac, but we're an Ishmael that we are a, 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 a child of the flesh. How do we get there? Because Paul makes it very clear in what we just read, that's not a work of God, that's a work of the enemy in our life. So that's not God doing that in you, that's a work of the enemy. How do we get there? And I, I wrote a question in my journal this week and I think it's on the screen. It says, what is keeping you from obedience in your relationship, your walk with Christ And what it is that keeps me from obeying in my walk with Christ is that I see obeying the rules as a way for God to love me. And I'm motivated by fear and not love. Because as we said last week, a heart that is transformed by love does not need to be commanded to love. Because we do the things that we love. How do we... How do we get from being that 
Isaac, that work of the spirit, to that of Ishmael, the work of the flesh, through this walk with God, this, this journey, this spiritual journey. How, how do we get there? And I think what happens is this, is we lose track of the gospel. We lose a clear view of the gospel and how God sees us and how God deals with us in our life. And a lot of things, I think, paint that picture for us. Can I be really, really transparent for a moment? You say, Mark, nothing is, seems to ever stop you in that area. I know, but I just want to be transparent with you for a moment. Because I dealt with this. And I think I dealt with this with God because I took the imprint of someone in my life and I laid it over God. And I somehow created God in the image of this individual in my life. And so for a long time, I had a real skewed view of God's relationship with me. I started out well, but at one point, I found myself being a, an Ishmael, that of a, a, a child of the flesh. I love God. I, I loved him with all of my heart, but I found myself trying to work for his approval. When I was 10 years old, my mom remarried and I acquired a stepfather. And my stepfather had a lot of rules. And there's nothing wrong with rules, so don't go there. In a minute, if I have time, we're going to go there and talk about the commands of God and how they work in our life differently now. But he had a lot of rules. And so my behavior with him was purely motivated by fear. And so because of that, I struggled with all the rules that he placed upon my life. And because of the punishment that I would receive when I didn't keep the rules, then I learned as a child how to become invisible. I don't know if you've ever done that or not, right? And that is like you stay out of somebody's way. Well, I learned how to stay out of his way. But I couldn't do that all the time. And, but, but I lived under this weight of I had to do this because I knew the consequences of displeasing him and I wanted to please him, but I knew that it was impossible to do that on my own. So I learned to hide from him and I learned to avoid him as much as I could, but yet there were moments when I would fail my stepfather. And when I failed him, then I knew the punishment for my failure. And the punishment of my failure was to be thrown against the wall, knocked through a door, punched, slapped, drugged by my hair to my room to be beaten by him. My father was only delighted in me when I pleased him. And I found it impossible to please him because I was imperfect. But when I met my heavenly father, not only did he forgive me, but he delights in me despite my persistent failures. Because I was told by my stepfather that I would be a loser and that I would be a failure if I didn't keep all of his rules. And I discovered with God 
the good days and the bad days don't count because he delights in me always. I didn't intend to say all of that. But I laid that over God and I tried desperately to keep all the rules because I was afraid that I would disappoint him. And when I came to the gospel, what I realized is that he doesn't count the good days or the bad days against me but he delights in me despite my persistent failure. Let that sink into your heart for a moment because that's what sets us free. He says in verse nine, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. And I have to say this to you this morning, that just a little can spoil the whole. Just a little can spoil the whole. That the process of that diminishing of grace within my life and your life takes place in the midst of our spiritual journey. It really does. Paul is writing to Christians. He's writing to Christians who love Jesus. He's writing to those that acknowledge that Jesus is risen and he was crucified. So he's writing this to Christians. And he says in the process of diminishing Uh, This process of diminishing our grace in our lives happens in the very middle of our spiritual journey. And it doesn't happen all at once. It happens gradual. It's subtle. It, it It is a process for you and I. It's all these moments, all these moments when I said a few weeks ago, we coined this phrase, Hagaring things, right? That in all these moments when we're Hagaring those, those times of our life, when we say to God, that God, I'm going to help you out, that God, I'm going to step in, that God, that I can fix this individual in my life, that I'm not going to commit it to prayer, and I'm not going to trust the Spirit, Lord, that I, I'm going to work this out in my life, that God, that I, I just can't stand where I'm working anymore, so I'm, I'm just going to take things in my own hands, not realize that maybe God has you there for somebody in their life as well, but I'm going to Hagar this thing. When all those things add up within our lives, that we find our focus is gradually changed from the cross to us. That I still love Jesus, yes, but my motivation is no longer based on his love. But now it's based on fear and other things because I'm trying to work this out on my own. And what I realized that legalism or whatever you want to call it, or works of the flesh or the cross plus performance or Hagar ideology, they're all a corrupting influence in my life. And what Paul was saying to the Jews in, in that setting especially they connected with this thought about that of a little leaven leavens the whole lump because when they saw leaven, what they thought about was that of evil influence and how just a little bit of influence, evil influence in your life can change your trajectory for your life. And he's saying, wait a minute, this is so serious for you that you just can't allow a little bit of this cross plus performance in your life. You have to forsake it all and you have to be free from it, is what he's saying. So much so that he says in verse 12, I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. And, And I read this to you four weeks ago, I think it was, It is a quote from Martin Luther's commentary on the book of Galatians. And here's Martin Luther's take on what Paul just said. 
He says, if this is the way you believe, then I wish the knife to slip during the surgery so you can't reproduce any more human beings that think like you think. So what I'm saying to you is, this Jesus plus theology is extremely dangerous. It's not something that you can take lightly in your life. It's not something that you can just allow to creep in and out of your life. It's something that you have to simply cast out of your life and be free of today. And he says, it is just simple faith in the gospel, the incarnate Christ, him crucified and risen. It's not a new technique or some mental ascension that simply unleashes some power for you. It's not you waiting for the latest revelation to come out. It's not that at all, that we are, that, that somehow, that, that we have to, we have to add to this or help God out. It's not that at all. It's faith working through love. It's the gospel working in your life that God is not keeping score on your behalf any longer. You're free. So Mark, where does that leave us? That leaves us with five more minutes. That's exactly where that leaves us. Yeah. Verse 13. (laughs) For you were called to freedom, brothers. You're called to freedom, Feel this, understand this. You were called to freedom. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So what is the test? So here's what he's been saying. He's been teaching to us about not losing your freedom. Be careful, not lose your freedom. He said allowing a little leaven will leaven the whole lump. Just allowing a little bit of this into your life, the cross plus performance, will flavor everything else within your life. So you can't even allow a little bit. So he said be careful not to lose it. Now he's saying, be careful not to abuse it. Don't abuse it. He's taken us from this trip of legalism to license. And he's saying to you and I, to fall back in legalism is to lose our freedom. But to fall into license to permissiveness means that we abuse our freedom. Here's what I want to say to you today before we pray, and it's this. Being free from the law does not mean that you are free to set your own standards. That's what Paul is going to leave us with before he changes gears and talks to us about keeping in step with the Spirit, and he talks to us about it through the Spirit. He leaves us with this thought that just because you're free from the law doesn't mean that you're free to set your own standards in this life, is what he's saying. So are we obligated or are we not? Yes. Mark, those are two questions. I know, one answer, right? Yes, we are. But the question is, are you attempting to be justified through your obedience to God's law? And that's what he's saying. No, that's not what this is about at all. Tim Keller puts it well, and I want to use this quote. He says this, Christians are freed from the law as a way to win merit from God, but we are not freed from the law as a way to please God. And so what Paul does, he ends with talking to you and I about how we care for one another. Because what is the test to show us if we're abusing our freedom, and that is, it's how we treat each other in this room. Isn't that interesting that he brings it back to relationships? He does. He brings it back to the way that you and I love each other. He says that you and I have this opportunity to love, but if I continually attempt to love you through the command that I must love you, then it creates a three-inch surface love between you and I. And that kind of love will not survive our disagreements. It's not going to survive the moments we don't see eye to eye. It's not going to survive the moments that you and I do not agree with each other theologically. Because if I'm not loving you through the gospel, then that kind of surface love will never survive our humanity. It's why Christians can't find unity in the middle of our differences because we're not loving each other through the gospel. Verse 14. 
For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Here's what Paul is saying. And I think this is important that he's saying this to us today because I know that you struggle with loving some people, even some people in this room. You say, well, Mark, I love everybody. You just broke a commandment. You lied. Do you know that? Because you don't. But what I realize is that my love for others and the gospel is inseparable. That my love for you and yours for me and my neighbor, as we just read, is not something that I compartmentalize in my life, that I can't love the gospel of Jesus and not love you in light of the gospel of Jesus. And I surely can't love you well and live outside or away from the gospel because faith is work through love. The test for my potential abuse of this freedom, Paul says, is relational. It's loving my neighbor as I love myself because what God has freed me to He's freed me to love him and to love you in the light of the gospel. Wow. How should I use my freedom in the gospel? Well, Paul says, hey, you can use it for the flesh. Yeah, you can. You can use it as license to do whatever you want. But he said, nonetheless, you're called to freedom, is what he says. But then he uses the word opportunity. What is the opportunity that he has given me to walk out this freedom? Is to love and serve others. So Mark, what extent am I to do that? He said that I'm to love you as I love myself. If you want to know how to conquer your flesh, then love others as you love yourself. It's the test of your freedom. Loving and serving. That you and I are loving others for the sake of the gospel, And we're loving each other from the sake of the gospel. I wrote this week in my journal as I've been really dealing with this and (sighs) that I wrote this for myself. The gospel frees me And I put Mark by that, that the gospel frees me to love from the gospel and not love to the gospel. And what that means to me is this, that the gospel is the catalyst for my love in this world for you and others around me. But that work of loving you does not cause God to love me anymore. Because where I am on that journey with him, wherever it is, he loves me as much at this very moment of my life as he 
as he ever will. And there's going to be days that I get it right. And there's going to be days I get it wrong. And what I realize is that God's not keeping score. So my heart wants to obey him because I don't fear him. Oh, I respect him greatly. I'm in awe of him, absolutely. But I know him and his great love for me. So for a moment, can I pray with you? If you would just take a posture of prayer, however that is. So Father, we sit here as your kids before you that you are our Father. And first of all, God, we take all of our human impressions off of you today. We remove them. for all the ways that we have tried to mold you into the image of some other authority figure in our life here, we remove that, Father, today. Help us by the Spirit to see you for who you are. Today, Father, free us of every bit of leaven. For every intention of ours to help you and to try to assist you in our life, for every deed that we try to catalog with you to make you love us in a greater way, God, remove that from us. Father, may we realize that we are lavished in your love and your grace today. And that no matter how much we try to control and cover our own sins, that we are completely incapable, no matter how many good things that we do in life, only your grace covers us. So, Father, you have set us free, called us to freedom, and you've given us an opportunity to walk that freedom out in loving and caring for those around us. So, Father, today, through the love of the gospel in our lives. Empower us to sincerely, from our hearts, love others around us. And so by we live out the gospel so that you would be known to those around us. But God, we will always struggle to love others around us and love ourselves if we don't come to this truth that you love us regardless of the good days or the bad days, that nothing in this life diminishes your love and care for us. 
So, Father, we don't have to spend our life trying to avoid you and stay out of your way. But you love us, Father, where we are at this moment of our lives. So, Father, let these truths be planted deep inside our spirit today. That they will grow and show great fruit in loving others around us and caring for those around us. Father, let this moment be transformational in our life. And Father, we thank you for we are free today your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with us for a moment of worship this morning, please? We're going to sing this song. We've sung it a couple of weeks in a row, but I, I challenge you to think about the words as you sing them this week um, and delight in this covenant of grace that we have Jesus' death and in the God who transforms us from the inside out.
Hey, thanks for joining us today and spending this time with us. Before you leave, would you take a moment to subscribe to our YouTube channel or go on Facebook and comment there so that more people have the opportunity to hear this message. Also, if you'd like to further engage, go to our website at hopeandanderson.com and subscribe to our newsletter as well. We'd love to see you on campus sometime. Our services are at 9 and 11 a.m. And we would love to have you here in person. So again, thanks for your time and have a great day.